Aye, troops, Koala here. Tanks have come a long way since their debut in the First World War, and as the vehicles have gotten more advanced, so too have the ammunition types available to them. As tank design changed, favoured ammo types transitioned from armour piercing rounds to cumulative or shaped charge warheads, and then back again thanks to changing doctrines and armour types. In today's episode of Koala Explains, we are going to have a brief look at the various different types of ammunition used by tanks from the Second World War to the modern day, and go over a few terms you may be unfamiliar with. This video is brought to you by supporters like you. Thanks for helping me make rent. Tank ammunition can be broken up into two main types, kinetic energy or armour piercing rounds, and chemical energy or shaped charge warheads, with several subtypes within those categories. The first and most basic shell type is your standard armour piercing or AP slug, basically just a big bullet with no internal structure or mechanism. This was your primary round of choice for anti-tank work early on, and was later improved with various inner workings to the shell, allowing for better ballistics, penetration or post-penetration effect, that is, the damage done to the interior of whatever you're shooting at. APC or armour piercing capped rounds could allow shells to better penetrate angled armour plates of enemy tanks, such as the Sherman T-34. Panther. A typical conical shaped round would simply ping off into space upon contacting a significantly angled plate, but by using a cap made out of softer steel, helping the round to angle down slightly on impact, the penetrative force of an APC round could be better directed into the armour plate. These AP caps however were relatively flat, which makes the shell less aerodynamic, giving it more drag and lower penetration at longer ranges, as these rounds rely entirely on kinetic force. To combat this, ballistic caps were invented, which introduce a more pointed shape to the tip of the round in the form of APBC rounds, solid AP slugs with the pointed ballistic cap on top, or APCBC rounds, armour piercing capped ballistic capped, which bring the benefits of both previously mentioned types. These shell types do their damage to the internals of a vehicle or fortification by creating clouds of shrapnel as they pass through, either from the round itself or from the armour they just penetrated. The latter is known as spalling, and is the main way AP rounds, capped or not, do damage. There are also shrapnel shells, which are designed to break apart much more violently upon penetration, making more use of shrapnel from the round itself than from spalling. While this does allow these rounds to create a larger shrapnel effect even against thinly armoured targets where less spalling would occur, Shrapnel shells lacked penetration capacity and were quickly rendered obsolete during World War II. To discuss what replaced them, however, we first need to look at chemical energy rounds. High explosive rounds were used to engage infantry positions and light fortifications, and had minimal capacity to actually penetrate armour. These shells consist of a thin steel casing, inside which is a large amount of explosive, usually TNT or a mixture of TNT with amatol or RDX, plus a mechanism to trigger it, similar to the way a regular gun works, with a hammer sparking the explosive charge. These rounds can also use a timed fuse, detonating the explosive with a timer or altimeter. These types of rounds were typically found in flak guns, such as the German 88mm of World War II, batteries of which would saturate an area with explosions and shrapnel at a predetermined height, fantastic for combating the formations of bomber aircraft used by the Allies. Later on, timed fuses gave way to proximity fused rounds, where a radio transmitter will detect a target at close proximity and detonate the shell. This meant that even if the range or altitude of the target were unknown, it could still be destroyed without a direct hit, as the projectile simply had to fly near the target at some point during its flight time. While it might require up to 50,000 rounds from anti-aircraft guns to destroy a single aircraft with direct hits, at least with World War II aiming technology, a timed fuse round could do it with just a couple hundred, and a proximity fuse round in just one or two well-aimed shots. Heading back over to the anti-armour spectrum, AP rounds could include HE filler, allowing the round to explode after penetrating an amount of armour and cause much more damage to the interior of a target. This was the theory at least, but in practice, the hollowed centre for explosive charge both lightened and weakened the shell, meaning less penetration, while the explosive content did end up creating much of a difference in overall damage dealt and APHE shells were quickly rendered obsolete as well. These APHE shells could also bring both armour piercing caps and ballistic caps to improve their angled penetration or range, just as with regular AP shells. These are also sometimes known as semi-armour piercing or SAP. 
As steel armour got ever thicker, the first instances of what are known as sub-caliber projectiles were invented. The design of these allows them to sit comfortably in a relatively large gun barrel, allowing for a larger explosive and hence higher velocity and range. The part of the round that penetrates armour, however, is far smaller than the diameter of the gun that fired it, allowing for some interesting effects. The first of these ammunition types was APCR, or Armour Piercing Composite Rigid, sometimes known as High Velocity AP or HVAP. These rounds have a type of jacket of lighter steel around them, creating the aerodynamic shape and allowing them to fit into the barrels of tank guns. The core of these rounds, however, is made of a much heavier and denser steel, giving it more force as it impacts the armour and putting all that force on a smaller point. The downside to these types of rounds is that they create less spalling and shrapneling, as only the core actually penetrates the plate, leaving the thinner metal jacket to shatter on impact. APCR also lacks penetration at range, and so variations of these rounds were created that do away with that thinner jacket immediately after exiting the gun barrel. These are known as APDS rounds, for Armour Piercing Discarding Sabo. The Sabo, or Sabo depending on where you're from, is that metal jacket, which is discarded after the round exits the barrel, flying off in petals. The Sabo means that the round can be fired from much bigger guns, which means more explosive and hence more power, but the core may only be half the diameter of the gun, making it much more aerodynamic than a full-bore AP round, and giving it a flatter ballistic curve and more penetration at long ranges. In modern tanks, you'll hear of APFSDS, or Armour Piercing Fin Stabilised Discarding Sabo. To describe what these rounds are is quite simple, they are APDS rounds with stabilising fins to keep them on course. To discover why they were so necessary, however, is slightly more complex. You may understand rifling to improve a gun's accuracy, the spin from the gun barrel giving a gyroscopic effect to the round as it flies. This only applies, however, when the round is roughly conically shaped like a bullet or AP shell. Modern sable rounds, however, have gotten quite long, as the longer round will mean more penetration of armour, but a long yet thin round will actually respond negatively to rifling, beginning to tumble end over end as it flies and veer off course, or at the very least slam into the target with the flat side rather than the sharp point of the rod. There are a variety of scientific reasons behind this effect, but suffice it to just say, physics. The stabilising fins on AP FSDS rounds are actually designed to negate the spin from a rifled gun, while at the same time replacing that stabilising function, much like the fletching on an arrow. The use of stabilising fins to counteract the spin from a rifled gun allowed these types of rounds to get much, much longer than standard AP shells, and while they may only be 27mm in diameter, the shells of an M1 Abrams, Leopard 2, or T90 may reach 800 to 1000 millimeters in length. Side note, all of those tanks, at least all but the initial Abrams variants, use smoothbore rather than rifled guns, which do not impart a spin at all, the fins only acting to keep the round on course. While armour piercing rounds developed into sub-caliber projectiles for penetration of thicker steel armour, first on German tanks like the Panther or Tiger II, and then Soviet tanks like the IS-3, a new type of chemical energy round had been developed to do much the same thing. These high-explosive anti-tank or heat rounds work in a very different way to either regular HE or AP rounds, and are what you might hear referred to as cumulative charge or shaped charge warheads. These shells consist of a cone of a softer metal such as copper, the open end of the cone facing the tip of the round where the target will be, and a concentrated explosive charge behind it. Upon contact, the round is fused just like a standard high explosive round would be, but uses that explosive force to both superheat and invert the softer metal cone, forming a jet that pushes through the metal armour at hypersonic speeds, creating a fireball on the inside. These shells are known as chemical energy munitions due to their reliance on explosive, but the actual penetrative effect is still kinetic, a metal projectile punching through the armour using kinetic force. The idea that the softer metal part is melted by the explosive and burns through the armour is not correct, as while the metal will get very hot in order to form it into shape, it is still well below its own melting point, let alone that of the armour plate. The explosive charge behind the cone-shaped lining means that these rounds do not lose any penetrative power at range, as the force needed to invert the copper cone and penetrate the armour is all contained within the round itself. 
The gun is only there to get the round to its target, and these heat warheads are also found in anti-tank missiles, air-to-ground missiles, or RPGs. Heat rounds also lose effectiveness thanks to the spin imparted by a rifled cannon, as the rotating motion of the projectile wastes some force laterally, spreading out the energy rather than concentrating it on a narrower point. For this reason, heat rounds would also include stabilising fins to become heat FS. In modern times where composite armour makes tanks nearly impervious to heat or heat FS rounds, this ammunition type is mostly relegated to use against soft targets, fortifications or low-flying aircraft, and has been renamed to Heat MP for High Explosive Anti-Tank Multipurpose, or in the US MPAT or MPAT for Multipurpose Anti-Tank. Heat warheads require room between where the explosion happens and the armour of the tank underneath, and so you'll often see what's called a standoff probe on the front of these munitions, designed to detonate the explosive further away from the armour, allowing that metal jet to form properly before it makes contact. If the detonation happens too far away from the armour, however, some of that power will be lost, especially when it comes to heat rounds without stabilising fins to counteract spin, which as we said, lose some power to the rotational force. To take advantage of this, spaced armour could be used, where the round will hit the outer layer, detonate, and only then impact the main body of the target. These shaped charge rounds are also easily defeated by explosive reactive armour, something we'll talk about more specifically in the next episode. But to counter this, tandem charge heat rounds were developed, wherein two warheads sit in the shell, one behind the other. The first activates the ERA, leaving the second to penetrate clean through the armour as if it weren't even there. Heat rounds became popularised as the main anti-tank munition during the later phase of World War II and the early stages of the Cold War, where tanks like the IS-3 were NATO's biggest threat. But as composite armour was developed, kinetic armour piercing rounds like APFSDS were switched back in, with tanks like the M60, Leopard 1 or Chieftain. When it comes to destroying fortifications or light armoured vehicles, however, what you really need is HESH. This stands for High Explosive Squash Head, but you'll also hear them refer to as HEP for High Explosive Plastic, or BESH if you're a truly cultured individual. HESH shells are not designed to penetrate armour, but instead rely entirely on spalling fragments from the armour itself, making them especially effective for demolition. They accomplish this with a large amount of plastic explosive within the shell, which spreads out across the target upon impact before detonating. The resulting explosion sends shockwaves through the armour, whether it be steel or concrete, rupturing the inner wall and causing huge amounts of spalling fragments in the target. A target destroyed by a Hesh shell may actually show no hole where the impact took place, just a large scotch mark with a plastic explosive detonated. On the inside, however, pure carnage. Unlike heat or sable rounds, HESS shells actually require rifling to work, as that same rotational force that wastes energy on a heat round disperses the plastic explosive pad further across the face of the armour, creating larger shockwaves which offer more damage. This is the main reason why Challenger tanks still use rifled guns, while every other main battle tank today uses smoothbore, but that is a topic for another video. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Koala Explains and that if you did, you'd leave a like, it really helped me out, and subscribe for more videos every week. Support us on Patreon to get access to exclusive content, early videos, our private Discord server where you can vote in polls, and much, much more. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the battlefield. Now, there are a ton of tactics you can use to defend incoming missiles outside of just pull a turn tight enough that they can follow, and these will become even more important to understand once we step into rank 7 with later missiles, including Fox 3s, so I'm going to talk about all of them in a future video. But the maps are so small currently that by the time you take off and gain enough speed to put any of those tactics to work, you're already too close to use them.